Good morning. How is everybody doing this morning? Thanks to those of you who are joining us live and in person here at the, at the Hilton Garden Inn. And for those of you joining us out there on Facebook, welcome to you as well. Week five of our series on spiritual toughness. I'd have to give a shout out because this is, this is a series slide number five. Can we just give a shout out to Tara? There have been five very different ones. We are blessed by her talents back there weekly. And I just had to take a moment and say, hey, thanks, Tara, for all your support through all this when I give you projects to take on during the weeks. So thank you very much. All right. First things first. I'm, I'm an educator at heart, so I gave you homework last week. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about your homework and see if we're up and going here. Remember, we ended last week. Our spiritual toughness training last week was two things. Well, the second one's really two things itself. It's really three. One was to be where your feet were this week. Be intentional about being in the spaces that God has put you in this week. And the second one was when you're in those spaces to listen to his greatest hits, not your own greatest hits, and to to choose confidence in those moments. So I'm going to give you a second to talk with a neighbor about a moment this week that you can reflect back on where you maybe were intentional about being where your feet were. You took a moment and said, okay, stop what I'm doing and focus on where I'm at right now and what I'm either supposed to learn or what I'm, what's needed for me in this moment. Or two, uh, a moment where you maybe were unsure but chose confidence anyway. I'll give you about 30 seconds, 45 seconds. trip and fall. All righty, I'm going to bring you back. If I was a good good elementary teacher, I'd give you five, four, three, two, and one. Hopefully you had a moment to share and reflect on that. You may not have thought about it before you walked in, but hopefully in that moment you thought, wow, that was a time. Um, where I chose to be in my feet, where I chose to have confidence in a moment I, I maybe wouldn't normally have confidence. I'm going to share a moment from this week, and I can't put the picture up, but I'm going to share a moment that, came, that happened actually in the Kennedy cafeteria. It wasn't a moment I saw, but something that was shared um, via the, our social media that our principal, Mr. Klein, saw, and I thought was a really cool moment of kids choosing to be where their feet were. So he was walking around the cafeteria this week during lunch and came across a table of students at lunch and a stack of about six phones stacked on top of one another in the middle of the table. And he's like, what's up with that? Why? And so he asked the question, why are those phones stacked in the middle of the table? And here's this, now, we're talking like 13, 14, probably 14, 15-year-olds here, folks, okay? Now, if you have 14, 15-year-olds, where is their head at usually? Boom, down on that phone, right? Their phones are stacked in the middle. I said, what's going on here? And they said, we stack our phones in the middle of the table so that we can have real conversations with one another during lunch. People choosing to be where their feet were, what can I learn? What's God got, what has God had planned for me in this moment? Um, I thought it was a cool moment that, that kind of highlighted what we were talking about last week, um, being where our feet are so that we can grow in the way God has planned for us. All right, so week five on this. Um, we're going to get into this last row. It's called it's, it's Stability. Uh, it, it's name, I'm going to start off here. I'm going to show a video. Tara's going to cue this up for you up here. I want you to watch this video, and we'll get into it this week. Oh, Tara, I'm pushing buttons and shouldn't be. This is, a, this is the monster. Is that what you're told? This is the monster at Adventureland. Anybody rode this ride? As you're on this ride. The ups, the downs. I don't, the twists, the turns. Roller coaster fans, raise your hands out there. Who's roller coaster fans? Who's not so much? All right, thank you, Tara. Roller coasters give us the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. And they're great at an amusement park. Not so great in our everyday lives. That roller coaster of emotions, those highs and those lows, not so great 
in our emotional lives. We can go from things are going great, life is great, life is fantastic, it's all going my way, to wow, life is hard. This isn't fair. Why is this happening to me? And we can do it in an instant. You can be so caught up in that high, you don't even see it coming. And then you trip up on something. And boom, you find yourself back in reality and in that low again. And we do it over and over. Like I said, a lot of fun at Adventureland or Valley Fair or Six Flags. Not a lot of fun in our day-to-day lives. And so that gets us to this last here we're going to talk about. Um, on this. I know there's some things above that, but frankly, we've talked about the accountability piece and we'll finish that up towards the end. But the last tier we're going to focus on here is that fourth tier that's highlighted up there, that emotional stability tier. And for those of you who can't see it, I know it's, you can see it online. I know it's, maybe you guys can see it okay up there, but there are four blocks in this tier. Emotional flexibility, responsiveness, strength, and resilience. Emotional responsiveness, flexibility, strength and resistance. And when I'm talking with our students about these blocks, um, oftentimes I'll talk to them about, um, well, this being where the rubber meets the road. Because we've been doing all this preparation. We've been talking about our focus. We've been talking about being where our feet were. We've been talking about being, being motivated by the right, right things. And now we get in these moments where now it's tested. And that's what this tier here is all about. See, one of the things that I'll talk with our students about during, during these sessions with our students is this mind-body connection. I'll talk to them about how our, and this is a process we'll, that we'll work through with them. We'll talk about them how their thought process drives their emotions. What I mean by that, their thought process, how they feel about something. How, they, how are they, go back to that, that self-talk I talked about last week. When they find themselves in a situation, how do they feel? What are, what's their thought processes wrapped around that situation? Because that's going to drive their, mo- their emotions. If they're confident in that moment and they feel like they're prepared for that moment, their thought processes are going to be positive. Their, their thought processes are going to be all about, I got this. I'm ready. This is what I prepared for. Here we go. And the, uh, the, their emotions that they're going to have will be excited and anticipatory engaged and connected with what we're about ready to take on. And then we'll talk about their physiological response. Those emotions are going to cause hormone releases in their body. And they're going to have a physiological response to that. See, if their thought process isn't positive, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Or maybe they're questioning their preparation for the week. Did they work hard enough that week? Did they listen to coach well enough? Did they study hard enough for that test? Did they practice enough? For that performance, if their thought process is negative, then their emotions will be about fear, about doubt, and their physiological physiological responses then are going to be different. See, when we're positive and engaging and connected, increased blood flow, heart rate stays under control, breathing rate stays under control. They can stay in control of their emotions. If our emotional response to a situation is fear and doubt and anxiety, that physiological response is different. The heart rate is going to elevate even more. Blood pressure is going to go up. There's actually a visual acuity that that studies will show that that in moments of fear and doubt or or, or anxiety, there's actually a, a, a reaction in the pupils of your eyes that doesn't allow light in and allow you to see your full field of vision in those moments. And we talk about how that thought process drives their emotions. Either they're excited and confident or they're, they have fear and they have doubt. And it impacts their physiological response in a moment. And it impacts their performance positively or negatively. That's what this tier, when I'm talking to this about, that's what this has been all about. One of the things when I'm watching competitions and watching performance with our students at Kenny as we're going through this whole process with them, uh, about you know this process of developing mental toughness is is I watch these competitions and I'm looking for that first moment of chaos that first moment when things don't go right maybe it's a, a they think it's a poor call from the official or maybe it's weather maybe it starts to rain during warm ups and something something they don't expect or something that's going to change the the script flip the script on them in some way shape or form how do they react because that's going to tell me where they're at. The athletes, the coaches, the directors, the performers, and tell me where they're at in that moment mentally. It's going to reveal their mindset 
uh, for that event? Are the emotions of the event going to control them? Or are they going to control the emotions of the event? And I'm looking for those things because that's, for lack of a better that's the moment of, te- that's, that's the testing moment. That's the moment we find out whether we're going to engage and connect in those moments or disengage and disconnect from those moments. It's one of my favorite spaces to talk to coaches and athletes about because it's that moment where we find out if all the training we've been doing has been focused on the right things, have we been motivated by the right things as individuals and as a team. Did we work hard enough? Did we practice hard enough? Did we prepare for the right things to be ready for, the, for, for that competition or for that event? Did we prepare for the right things? Did we buy into the game plan for my coaches? Did they prepare the right game plan? If the answer to those questions is yes, then we'll see a positive emotional response in those, uh, in, in those situations. We'll see confidence. We'll see them leaning in to moments. We'll see them engaging and connecting in moments rather than stepping back from them, disengaging, disconnecting from those moments. And you can tell what that emotional response is. Okay, Aaron. Great, again, I keep coming back to these, 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 these sports or these, these performance analogies, but think about our own days. It fits there too. How many times is that first negative or unexpected event of your day give you a real strong indication of the way the rest of your day is going to go. You walk into the office, walk into the job, or you leave the house, stop by the gas station, and you spill your coffee, or you forget something at home, or somebody comes up to you at work and hits you. You haven't had a chance to put your coffee down, take your coat off, and somebody's hitting you with something at work and saying, hey, I need this from you. What's our response in those moments? Where's our mindset? Because our thoughts will drive our emotions. Those emotions will drive our physical, physiological response and we're either going to stay calm and problem solve and fix or we're going to get uptight and frustrated and angry and that's going to dictate the rest of our day. That's what this week's all about. More than I'd like to admit it, I've got to spend a little more time probably evaluating my own emotional stability, my own spiritual stability, if you will. So I reflect back on these last several weeks, and it's one thing to talk about by being, being motivated by God's unwavering love. It's one thing to talk about being motivated by Christ's immeasurable sacrifice on the cross. It's one thing to spend time in prayer, spend time in God's word, spend time connecting like this with other Christians. So it's one thing to spend time finding ways to serve others as Christ served us, finding ways to share the good news with others. It's also one thing to talk about that positive God speak, letting God drive the messages in our heads, the thought processes in our heads, rather than us and our fears and our doubts driving those thought processes. See, it's it's all well and good to talk about those things and do those things and prepare in those ways when things are going well. But what about when resistance rises up? What about when struggle shows up? What about when adversity rears its ugly head? In those moments, do I find myself staying God-centered? On all those things we've been talking about and trying to work on, our spiritual toughness training? Or do I find myself reverting back to me-centered? What I'm comfortable with. Where I'm kind of more of a dictator of what goes on rather than having to trust God that he's got this. Do I revert back to my plans or do I trust God's plans? Do I take a moment in those those situations and say, whew, didn't see that coming. Didn't expect that to hit me in this moment, Lord. But I'm going to trust that you've got this because you've created this moment for a reason. I'm going to take a deep breath and trust it and trust your plans for this moment. Or do I come back and revert back to, again, what I'm comfortable with and the way I responded, which usually isn't positive, doesn't leave that person with a great impression of me and doesn't solve any problems and, as a matter of fact, probably creates more. When that adversity sets in, do I rely on my own willpower when I get knocked down to get back up or do I rely on God's willpower? I think we both, we all know how it works out if we rely on our own willpower to get back up versus God's. 
Do I run back to where I'm comfortable or do I embrace the uncomfortable that God is asking of me, asking of us? So I'll go back to this, except instead of mind-body connection, I'm going to talk about this from a God-body connection. In those moments, I'm going to say performance because I, I'm going to back up. On we, don't, we aren't performing for God. Okay, so when I talk about performance, you see performance down there. We're not performing for God here. When I talk about performance at the end of this whole thing, when we talk about performance, we're talking about our connection to God. We're talking about our being motivated by our God, being motivated by our relationship with Christ, and letting that be what drives us. That's our performance. We are performing for God's approval. Mm -mm. <laughs> Thank goodness I have to depend on that. Right? But I'll come back through this. So what's our thought process when we reach those moments where God's testing us? I'll probably say that wrong too. When those moments when that spiritual toughness, can I really follow through and be God-centered or am I going to revert back to being me-centered because that's what's more comfortable and that's what I know. And even though it's wrong, that's what I trust. Or can we step out and say, okay, God, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. I'm not sure where this is going. I am way, way uncomfortable right now. That person's hurt me. That person's frustrated me. I've never done that before, and you're asking me to do what? Can we be God-centered in our thought process and therefore drive emotions of confidence and trust? Or are we going to revert back to being me-centered, which is going to drive emotions of fear and doubt in that situation, in that moment? The challenge in these moments is to not run back to where we're comfortable. God wants us to grow. God wants us to connect with him. Jesus wants us to love him and trust him and engage with him because they've got big, big plans for us. They've got ways they want to use us. We haven't even thought of, we haven't imagined yet. And those moments when they come out of us, we don't even see them coming. And when those moments come, what's our process going to be? So our spiritual toughness training this weekend. Wow, you're getting to that early, but we got more coming. Our spiritual toughness training is to spend some time thinking about those moments. When these moments of engagement arise, can we pause, reset our thought process a little bit, and rather than reverting back to me focus, can we, can we focus instead on moving forward God-focused? Give you an example of what I'm talking about. My wife's going to laugh at me here because probably eight days out of ten if I'm coming home, hey, how was your day, dear? I'll talk about an engagement with a student in the hallways that just frustrated me that day. That's a moment of engagement. See, I do. I believe in my heart that... that I tried a lot of different, as a college and, and growing up, I tried a lot of different ways to become something else other than an educator. And God kept bringing me back to being an educator. I believe God planned for me to be an educator. Planned for me to be where I'm at, doing what I'm doing, influencing from that platform in the way he needs me to influence. I believe that my whole heart. But then I come across these situations, these moments a student in the hallway, they're supposed to be in class at the vending machine and they're just dilly-dallying and taking their time and they want to be there. They're being loud. They're having a conversation. And all of a sudden, there's three or four students gathered there. And they're not where they're supposed to be and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's a moment of engagement. Do I pause in that moment and reset my thought process and think, man, God's got me here in this moment for a reason. And I'm, so I'm going to engage from a God-focused, God-centered standpoint, or am I going to focus from a me-centered standpoint? They're not where they're supposed to be. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They aren't, they aren't acting the way they're supposed to act. They're disrupting the school day and get frustrated. And, and go back to that thoughts, drive emotions, drive physiological response. All of a sudden, my adrenaline is up. I'm excited, and I'm frustrated, and, I'm like, and, and that's how I engage. What if I step back for a second and pause from a God-centered focus standpoint and say, God put me here to help these kids figure life out. Whew. That's the spiritual toughness training this week, folks. And 
I probably need a little bit of that. I think we all, I, as I talk about that, I'm sure, I'm hoping you can all engage in something in your mind of situations that come up and you're like, I got to take a moment and pause and come at this from a God-centered focus rather than a me-centered focus or it's not going to go the way God intended. So that's our training. All right, so I got about nine minutes left to wrap this baby up. We started five weeks ago going back to our foundational verse as a church, John 10.10. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. You go to different versions and it came to so that they might experience abundant life. This whole series has been about how can we experience abundant life? How can we be spiritually tough, build spiritual toughness, we can experience abundant life even when it's hard? When I spoke at the beginning of this series, I spoke about how this topic had been in my mind for months. I'd been thinking about this for a long time. If I'm going to be honest about the way I was thinking about this for all that time, God's encouragement to take on this series, God's encouragement to grow in this series, and I was thinking about being spiritually tough. I was thinking about all the things we can do to build our spiritual toughness. Just like when I'm working with my students or my athletes or my coaches, I was thinking about all the things we can do to build our spiritual toughness. When I thought about this, developing our spiritual toughness, I thought about how that can lead to us experiencing this abundant life. If we can just build up our spiritual toughness, if we can do all these things, then we can experience the abundant life that we're looking for, that we desire to experience. I even read an excerpt from Mark Batterson and I still believe this is true, but one of the excerpts in week one I read from Mark Batterson, and just I think back on this about the growth of this whole series, where I said this, or Mark Batterson says this, we have to pray like it depends on God, but we have to work like it depends on us. And there's a lot of truth to that, but that was still feeding the focus. I started this whole thing on that I've been thinking about for months. See, this journey has become very different than I'd imagined. In fact, you might say it requires some emotional flexibility, on my part as we went through it. Because this series has shifted gears. This series is not about how hard we can work to be tough for God. Let me say that again. This series, i pick one takeaway for you from it, is this isn't about how hard we can work to be tough for God. This series about, it has ended up being about how we need to connect with God in our relationship with him. And that's where we'll find our spiritual toughness. This series has become about Christ's strength on the cross, his sacrifice for us, and how we need to have that connection with him. We need to have that loving relationship with Christ. That's where we find our spiritual toughness. That's where we find our abundant life. We spent four weeks on this, focusing on strengthening our relationship with God, trying to grow closer, connect more deeply. That's where we find that abundant life. It's in that relationship with God through Jesus that we find the motivation, the connection, the confidence to pursue becoming who God's designed us to be. As we start to wrap this thing up, well, okay, where's the starting point for all this? If I'm going to take this journey, Aaron, I'm going to, and we're going to try to develop a stronger relationship and connect more deeply with God, where does it start? It's a simple answer. Go back to John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10. Actually, I'll go back to 6. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration, talking about the, the, you know, the sheepfold and, and, and being the shepherd and, and, and the gate. So he's referring back to earlier verses. He says, those, those who had heard Jesus use this illustra- illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them in this way. I assure you, I am the gate for the sheep, he said. All others who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I, Jesus is saying, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Wherever they go, they will find green pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life, the abundant life, in all its fullness. 
the starting point is being all in for Jesus. The starting point is taking that moment and just saying, Jesus, I'm all in for you. And that's where we start off. It's in and through Jesus that we experience abundant life. It is in and through Jesus that we connect to our loving God. It is in and through Jesus that we find our spiritual toughness, our focus in our relationship with God. Why do we find it there? Because Jesus tells us he's the good shepherd. He was willing to lay his life down for us so that we can have that connection with God. He said, I came so they might have life and have it abundantly. He gave us the gift of abundant life if we're willing to be all in with him and engage with him. That's where we're going to find our abundant life. So going back, I made a different pyramid. So how do we engage it? First, be all in. Because when we're all in, folks, that's when we're going to be motivated by the right things. If we're all in for Jesus, we'll be motivated by his sacrifice for us on the cross. We'll be motivated by God's love who, who gave us his only son to die for us. When we're all in for Jesus, then we're willing to do the preparation work we have to do. We're willing to engage in prayer. We're willing to read the word. We're going to be more focused and more excited about reading God's word, about connecting with others in worship and in praise, about giving back the resources that God has given us and so greatly blessed us with, about connecting with others and about serving the way Christ served his disciples, about sharing the news of Christ with those who God brings across our path. When we're all in for Jesus, our focus becomes very, very easy. It becomes easy to be where our feet are when we're talking with God, when we're engaging with Christ. It becomes easy to listen to God's greatest hits if we're all in for Jesus rather than listen to our own greatest hits of past failures and I'm not good enough. It becomes easy to focus on going forward in confidence. Why? Because we talked about that last week. God promises us to be with us wherever we go. Jesus promises to be with us until the end of the age. We're focused and we're all in on Jesus, then we know he's with us and we have confidence in taking on whatever he puts in our path. When we're all in for Jesus, it's easy to be God-centered. Well, easier, not easy, <laughs> but easier to be God-centered when those moments of engagement come up. To take a breath and say, God's got me for a reason, and he sent me Jesus to be with me in this moment. And so I'm going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to engage in this from a God-centered perspective, not based on my doubts, my fears. It's in that relationship that we're going to find abundant life. And it's not an easy path for us to be on, and we've talked about that. We are not a group of people here in Oasis Church who have this all together. We know that. We talk about that all the time. For those out there wondering, hey, do I want to join this group? Do I want to be a part of this? We are not. We don't stand here saying, woohoo, look at us. We got it all together. We don't. We absolutely do not have it all together, but that's why we're here. That's why we're gathering as a church. That's why we come together and say we're Oasis Church because we're going to be in this thing together. Through all the struggles and all the successes, we're going to be in this thing together. We come here so we can connect with God through Jesus together and grow in our faith, grow in our love for one another, grow in our love for Christ and be on this journey together to experience the abundant life that Jesus came and died for. So, so we're, gonna, we're kind of growing and, and challenging ourselves. And through that connection and through that relationship, build up our spiritual toughness so we can experience that abundant life. We're gonna do that together. Oasis Church, how's that sound to all you? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your amazing love and your immeasurable sacrifice for us. Lord, we know that our spiritual toughness doesn't lie in the things we can do, but instead in our connection and relationship with you. Help us and guide us as we work to grow deeper in that relationship and stronger in our connection to our loving God. Help us to give glory to you in all of our successes, and lean on you when the struggle might be more than we can bear. In all things, Jesus, use these things to draw us closer to you. 
We want to experience the abundant life that you came for, the abundant life that you died for, the abundant life that you so desire for us, Lord. We want to experience that with you. In your amazing name, Jesus Christ, amen.